Okay, so this is another question related to the climate battery video series that we did. And so Chris asks, so why did you not separate the two levels of tubes more? Wouldn't it have allowed more heat or cool storage and better efficiency of the system? Also, why everything inside the greenhouse? So I'm not sure I totally understand the last part of that question, but the first part was asking specifically about the earth tubes that go between the manifold on the east and the west of the greenhouse. And so if you're not sure what I'm talking about in this video, I will leave a, a card up here that you can go and check out that will link to the videos of us building this geothermal heat system that's storing heat in the greenhouse. So you can catch up on that over here. So the reality is, and, and I mentioned this in one of the other videos, uh, we're gonna do a white paper to discuss all the things that we learned about this system as a result of all the transient thermal dynamic modeling that we did on this greenhouse. We spent a lot of time uh, doing this. But one of the things that we looked at, we, we tried to figure out, number one, do these geothermal systems actually work? That was the first thing that was important to us. And so how do you actually test that in a model? So the first thing we did is we took some heuristics, which are basically kind of rules of thumb that the industry has been using for a number of years. Everybody claims that these certain criteria work in these systems. So how many air changes per hour, how many pipes, and, and to be honest, if you look at the YouTube videos, there's a lot of systems that are pretty shoddy. They don't really make any sense from a physics and thermodynamics perspective. And so we started off with some base principles that we would typically use to design a heating and cooling system in a building. So understanding fan laws and airflow and thermodynamics. And then we applied these heuristics. So one of the heuristics, for example, is you want uh, about five to six air changes per hour going through that system. Okay, so once you know the volume of your building, then you can figure out how many cubic feet of air has to move through that system per hour. And then you can back calculate that into CFM. And from there you can size a fan. Once you know what that CFM flow is, then you can use fan laws to decide how big your manifold has to be and how big the individual earth tubes have to be. And if this sounds complicated, it is a little bit complicated, but we have a really simple tool that comes with our passive solar greenhouse tool uh, course, sorry. And I'll leave a link to that in the show notes below if you're interested in getting that tool or taking the course. That uh, Excel spreadsheet tool helps you to calculate both the volume of the greenhouse as well as the CFM flow rate that you need for the system to work. So it turns out that the rules of thumb that, that the industry uses are pretty close and they actually work quite well. So five to six air changes per hour is a pretty good number to start with. We're gonna test that empirically in this system just to make sure that it, 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 it uh, nets out, but the model seems to indicate that it works. We then wanted to test to see where the limiting factor in the system was. So was the limiting factor airflow rate. And so what we did was we doubled, tripled, and quadrupled the airflow rate inside the system to see if more air would transfer more energy. We tested to see if the pipes that we used, which were plastic, were the limiting factor. And so we actually changed the material inside of the thermodynamic modeling software to be um, a material that has infinite heat transfer capability because plastic doesn't transfer heat very well. So imagine an imaginary material that has no thermal resistance. And we found out that it wasn't the actual thermal resistance of the pipe that was uh, the weak link, which was really interesting. We also looked at doubling, tripling, and quadrupling the number of pipes in the greenhouse to increase the amount of energy storage. And we found that that didn't really make a big difference either. And then we did all the same experiments that I just mentioned and we halved it. And what we came to was this five to six air changes per hour seems to be pretty good. And the other thing that we found out through all the different models is that we were able to keep this greenhouse in the model above zero without any fossil fuels until mid-January, which we're gonna, again, we're gonna test that empirically. And so kind of interpolating all of those findings that we found in that model, what appears to be happening is the majority of the energy storage is occurring as a result of condensation. And we could say the opposite as well. Most of the cooling that occurs inside of the greenhouse has to do with evaporation. So when evaporation occurs, you get a cooling effect. When condensation occurs, you get a heating effect. So as the air, which is moist and warm in the summertime, moves through the system and it condenses, then the energy comes out of the air and into the soil. In the winter time, as the air is cold and dry and it moves through the system and it evaporates moisture, it gets heated up. And so the earth cools down, the air heats up. And so that's one of the main reasons that these systems have to use perforated weeping tile. Okay, so Big O is another name for it. It's basically corrugated polyethylene pipe. 
that allows moisture to move between the soil and the air. And so the majority of the energy transfer is occurring as a result of that uh, exchange between those two mediums. And so to back to your question, why didn't I put more space between the pipes? Why didn't I put more pipes in? We designed the system based upon what the thermodynamic model produced. And so now we have to test to see if our hypothesis is correct. So in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're going to put temperature probes on the inlet and outlet of the system. So we're gonna measure both the temperature of the air coming into the system and coming out, but we're also gonna measure the relative humidity of the air going in and out of that system. And what that's gonna allow us to do is it's going to allow us to determine if um, how much energy is being dropped into the soil because the energy transfer is gonna be a function of the change in relative humidity as well as the change in temperature from inlet and outlet. So the short answer to your question is adding more pipes and separating it between the soil layers, we had a pretty good separation in there, isn't really going to influence the ability for that system to exchange energy. However, all of this is subject to empirical observations as we get this system set up. So stay tuned for that. If you are not subscribed to the channel and you wanna follow the progress, make sure you're subscribed. And if you wanna get access to that white paper that I talked about, make sure you're on the Verge newsletter and I'll leave a link to that subscription link down below and we'll be emailing that white paper out. You may also be interested in our case studies. We've gone around Western Canada and we've documented greenhouses right across the country and we're starting to get some in the United States as well. So you may wanna check the, those case studies out. It'll give you some ideas on different greenhouse designs that you may be able to incorporate into your own greenhouse on your own property. Okay guys, see you in the next video. Thank you.